Chapter 4 in which Oscar wonders who was responsible for ruining both his suitcases and the hotel he'd left them in, before attempting to run the perpetrator over when he finds out. Thrilled that Horace sensed he might be more than tourist, Oscar said, I ought to go to the police and see if they can identify her from a description. Horace began pacing again. No, I don't think that wise. Firstly, I think you've witnessed enough of Rouen's policing to realise it leaves much to be desired. And secondly, despite what you saw, I do not believe that animal was responsible. Well, why not? I have a suspicion that the extent of devastation was not at all her intention. But she was involved? Bremble asked. Yes, certainly, said Horace. But it is not as clear-cut as you might think. I have been on the council ten years and have witnessed the increasing frustration young residents feel beneath the pajami. Indeed, I suspect it's almost a game for her. Of cat and mouse, if you will. Adjusting his monocle, he dabbed his eye. I believe the animal you suspect might have been coerced into organising this evening's horror. I do not imagine she meant such severity, as prior protests have caused no more than irritation. He looked at them both. Something evil has inserted its claws, and I suspect this entire conflict has become something of a one-sided battle. Though you are right, young cat, we do need to find her. Glancing at his wife, he asked when the next new moon might be. Unsurprised by such request, she went to check a calendar. Tomorrow, actually, she said. Well, what are you suggesting? asked Oscar, imagining some sort of midnight covert operation. I'm not suggesting anything, young cat, said Horace. You said you were interested in curiosities. Well, you shall have dinner here tomorrow evening, after which I shall show you something very curious indeed. Something that might offer a clue as to how we might end this madness, because I fear, if we do not, then this madness shall end us all. The following morning, Horace dropped Oscar by the police station in the centre of town, before he went to visit suffering colleagues. Intending to offer himself as a witness, Oscar imagined the police's incompetence would hemorrhage answers. For a city harbouring no crime, their ineptitude was absurd although it might explain last night. No wonder the pyjami had been so horrid, clearly such protests touched several raw nerves. Oscar wondered again who that brazen young cat was and how he might find her. Then she arrived at the police station at the same time as he. In fact, they almost touched paws. For the third time they gaped at each other, until the dervy hissed and spat. She whirled around, seeking a means of escape. He stared at her and then cried, Hey! She ignored him and ran to purloin a parked moped. With paws frantic, she fiddled with its starter until the thing fired into life. Without a glance at traffic, she bounced into its current. Cars hooted and one screeched to a stop, the driver leaping from it and shouting profanity so that left Oscar regretting Rouen's language wasn't as foreign as the place was. Shocked. Oscar advised him that there was never excuse for such language, particularly in that tone, before taking his car. Glancing over her shoulder, the dervy watched the car weaving in pursuit. With curses of her own, she tucked her tail into the seat, a bit like a seatbelt, and revved the thing. She zipped through traffic and buzzed through intersections, her red scarf flittering as though wanting nothing more to do with her. Stabbing his paws at the car's pedals, Oscar bore down upon her, weaving between pedestrians and cars, both moving and stationary, before ploughing through some parcels of cheese launched in her wake. He swore too, it being difficult enough negotiating Rouen's maze of streets without having to dodge the contents of a supermarket as well. When things got particularly difficult, he closed his eyes and put his paw down, convinced things would be more capable of dodging him than he was dodging them. The dervy took a sharp right, which would have been fine were it an intersection, but it was not, and left her screaming at pedestrians silly enough to believe the pavement was theirs alone. 
Amid shrieks and yells, she tore through tables and chairs, spilling bacon, launching buns and splattering hot fins everywhere. Oscar, certain her unorthodox use of pavement left the animals upon it as primed as they'd ever be should he follow, promptly did so. With one poor parping pon horn, the other battled the steering wheel as tyres grappled for grip. Sprawling through her wake, he yelled apologies at those hysterical and ploughed after her. Her moped screaming, the derby zipped down an alley and raced out the other side. Bouncing through a break in traffic, she wobbled onto pavement again before disappearing into a laneway. Over cobbles and through gutters, bumping over bricks and fallen plaster, the derby raced her one-geared steed. Skidding out of the laneway, she took a hard left, and then another, and then a hard right. In fact, at this speed, they were all difficult. Whirring along pavement, she glanced over her shoulder, relieved to see nothing of the lurching car. With a wobble, she pulled back into traffic and headed toward Rouen's outskirts, though did so directly in front of Oscar. Having lost her several streets earlier, Oscar was bereft of ideas and driving a stolen car wasn't helping foster any new ones. When the derby reappeared in front of him, he resorted to leaning from the window and yelling, Hey! at her again. Startled, she wobbled all over the place, before tearing away between opposing lines of traffic. Grinding the car into another gear, Oscar followed. The car required considerably more room than the moped, which he didn't get, at least not initially. And when he did, it was amidst a chorus of horns and expletives only marginally more offensive than those of the car's owner. Beyond the city walls, the road snaked toward the towering ranges and wound between huge crags of granite. When the derby overtook a truck, Oscar had to wait for it to struggle uphill before managing the same, suspecting the car's highest speed was reverse, and then only with a headwind. While the moped swallowed corners easily, the car choked on them, and the derby soon increased her lead. Swinging around escarpments, Oscar struggled to see anything of her ahead. When the road turned toward the coast and untangled, he barreled along it straight. Around another corner, he spied her dust. With a growl, he threw the car into a gear it didn't know existed and plunged his paw onto the accelerator. With the road now gravel, tires clamoured for grip and the moped slid all over the place, bouncing as though its wheels were square. When the road tightened suddenly, the derby shredded its corner with a balance bordering on lost and disappeared around a bend in a flurry of pebbles. Oscar braked heavily, cursing both her bravery and insanity. When he rounded the same corner, the moped was nowhere to be seen. He slammed on the brakes and tore to a halt in a hail of dust and gravel. The engine stalled, spluttered and died. He wrenched open the door, jumped out and looked around. There was no sign of the animal or of the moped, nothing other than the low thunder of waves pounding cliff. Coughing through dust, he ran ahead to see through clearer air. Nothing. No moped. And no distant buzzing. Then he realised. He edged toward the cliff, and his collapsible field survival tummy almost collapsed itself when he saw how far down the sea was. Upon all fours, he peered over its edge and whispered expletives he hadn't a hope of spelling. The twisted mess of moped remained caught in a tangle of roots jutting from the cliff face and clinging to one end of a scarf while the other remained caught in its chain, swung the derby. Oh no, he whispered before yelling, hold on! This he immediately regretted, and not only because she was left less than impressed. Oh really? she shouted. I mean, are you sure? I was considering my options here for a while and was toying with the idea of trying something a bit different because so far holding on hasn't improved my situation noticeably. Clearly insane of the mind after all, Oscar growled, hurrying back to the car to find something with which to retrieve her. The boot surrendered a first aid box which contained a half-chewed aspirin and three used plasters a jump lead, a broken corkscrew, 
a road hazard sign which was broken and covered in tyre marks, and an unopened packet of crispy scales. There was nothing to aid the rescue of a dangling animal. He ran back to the cliff to see how she was managing. How are you managing? he called down. Can you see any way of getting up? Her voice was faint over the thunder below, though her tone was quite apparent. Yes, actually. Fortunately, there's a convenient flight of stairs that has been thoughtfully placed nearby. But I've refrained from using them, preferring to wait until you said death did it. Oscar said nothing. Under the circumstances, her elocution was admirable. Then she screamed, Get me up from here! Indignant at her insinuation this was in some way his fault, Oscar was nevertheless at a loss. He frowned. Being a velvet paw of Asquith does afford certain advantages over other animals in a similar quandary, and he opened his collapsible tummy to exploit one of them. From it, he took out two fluff grenades and unscrewed their caps very carefully. He removed from each a coiled thickness of extra fluff and laid them upon his pantaloons. Grasping a pawful of his fluffy tummy fur, he pulled, winced, and placed it next to the extra fluff. After three more pawfuls, he took his fluff and the extra fluff and began kneading them together. From beyond the cliff, a voice arose. Hello? Are you still there? Indignant, Oscar ignored her. With further pawfuls of his luxuriously fluffy fur, he kneaded the fluff into a growing sausage of thick fluffiness. When the consistency was right, he began rolling it between his paws. As the rope lengthened, he twisted and plaited its strands into a remarkable length. The dervy continued to curse, which left him relieved. While she had the strength to hurl abuse, she'd have the strength enough to cling. After tying a stone to one end, he wound the rope up and threw it over his shoulder. He scrambled to the cliff's edge and yelled down a brief summary of his knitting and what he intended to do with it. After lowering the rope, he readied to swing it towards her. How close is it? he yelled. Not close enough. He let it down further, surprised she hadn't called halt when there was no more to offer. It needs another twenty paws or so, she shouted. I can't reach it from here. Cursing, Oscar peered over the edge. She was quite right. Although she dragged herself up the scarf, the wind bowed the rope, rendering it too short. Winding it up, he scrambled from the edge and ran back to the car for another search. The jump lead wasn't nearly long enough, and there was nothing resembling a vine either in the boot or on the roadside. It was all shrub and rock. At a loss, he began treadling, unable to think of anything other than attempting to climb down himself. The notion made his tummy do unsocial things, which would only compromise their eventual acquaintance. He returned to the cliff and peered down. Still she clung, though her abuse lessened as strength withered. After more curses, he yelled down a second summary of intention, though with less conviction than the first. Crouching, he turned and poked a hind paw over the edge, his fluffy pantaloons flailing at the empty space beyond. Feeling nothing beneath upon which to lodge a paw, he swore through his scarf, which he then stared at. It was forgivable that he hadn't considered his scarf earlier. Velvet paw training doesn't mention scarves when it comes to improvising rope from fluff grenades and collapsible tummy fur, presumably because scarves would have been blindingly obvious in the first place. While he struggled to drag himself back from the edge, he swore to make certain it would from now on. He then cursed his fluffy pantaloons, which did nothing to help him grip the roadside, and he fought for traction before eventually managing to scramble to his paws. He ripped off his scarf, tied it to the length of rope and hurled it back over the cliff. Yelling at her again, he did some emergency rope swinging. When the cat made no reply, he despaired she was lost. Despair was quickly evicted, however, when the rope was pulled. Surging with hope, he called out, Have you got it? Yes, 
but it will never hold me, it's far too thin. Oscar swore with relief. Don't worry, it will, just tell me when you're ready. She did, and with all his might, he scrabbled back toward the car, pulling until the cat rose into view. Grabbing at the cliff herself, she struggled over its edge until able to collapse upon it. Oscar did the same against the car, with both focusing on pants, coughs and relief for some time, with neither having the strength of words for either. Eventually, flopping a paw onto her dusty tummy, she said, Thank you. Oscar glanced at the boot and asked whether she fancied a packet of crispy scales. While she answered through a swathe of coughs, he staggered over to her and offered a paw, which she stared at before taking. Her eyes were a bright amber, and would have matched her orange tabby stripes marvellously had she not been covered in dust, engine oil and more grass than a spring meadow carpeted in the stuff. He returned to the car, retrieved the packet of crispy scales, and offered her the bag. She eyed him warily, took the bag, and began stuffing pawfuls of scales into her mouth. "'Are you going to arrest me?' she asked when room for words returned briefly. Uh, "'What?' She didn't repeat herself, and continued stuffing her face instead. "'No,' said Oscar. "'I'm not going to arrest you. I'm not a police officer. But I would really appreciate some idea of what in fluff is going on here.' She munched, but offered nothing. Sighing, Oscar turned to the battered car, its appearance complimenting theirs rather well. Clapping his dusty paws together, he said, Well, I'd better try and get this muppet of a thing to start, otherwise we'll be walking back. Sitting in the car, he tried to start it. The car coughed and spluttered, implying that like them, it had just about enough for one day. He tried again, but still nothing except a whir, a cough, and an obscene swearing of engine. While she continued to stare, he ignored her, pretending that not only was he accustomed to this sort of thing, but that this time he'd make things a little more interesting by pretending he had no idea about cars. Mm -hmm.